God, a mighty fortress you are. But 500 years? What's up with that? And here we are, third millennium, all of us. What's up with us? Speak to us. These moments in the Word, we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a sultry afternoon in July 1505. Lone traveler trudging up the parched road that leads to a little Saxon village called Stutterheim. It's obviously a young man, sturdy. He's dressed like a university student. And as in Michigan, out of nowhere, <laughs> sky dark, heavens open up, deluged. And a man with one split of lightning is thrown into the mud. He pushes himself up with a scream, Satan, help me. I will be a monk. His most popular biographer puts it this way. I'll put Roland Bainton's words on the screen for you. The man who thus called upon a saint was later to repudiate the cult of the saints. He who vowed to become a monk was later to renounce monasticism. A loyal son of the Catholic Church, he was later to shatter the structure of medieval Catholicism. A devoted servant of the Pope, he was later to identify the Popes with Antichrist. For this young man was Martin Luther. So here we are, 500 years later. I mean, please. Protestant Reformation, who cares? 500 years? What difference does it make now? In fact, if we could bring somebody back from the dead, if we had two dead men to choose over, and let's put them on the screen, we know which one we'd bring back just like that. Why? Because we live in a time of nanosecond quantum change. There's too much yet to be done. We don't need dusty, old, long ago thinking. Hmm. And yet, could it be that this boy from Germany who flipped the world upside down could it be embedded in what he raised up are the seeds of one more reformation, the new reformation? And not wanting to look back and become nostalgic about the past and wanting, like you, to push forward with a dream to dream, I say, let's go. Come on. The rest of the world's thinking about it. Why shouldn't we? Now, we're going to do things backwards. Because normally, here's what you do. You share the story, you think about it, and they say, okay, out of this story, what can we draw? Are there any lessons we can draw? Forget it. We're not going to do that. We're going to turn it upside down. Let's start with the lessons and think about the story later. I want to share them with you. Four takeaways, four legacies from that 500-year-old Reformation that we can take with us into the new Reformation that is about to begin. Four of them. Count them. But first, I want to go to a passage that is so Martin Luther-esque that it's worth our contemplating. A little book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Open your Bible with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 1. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Four takeaways, all embedded in that passage as well. Grab your study guide. Let's go. It's in your worship bulletin. Pull it out. You didn't get a study guide? We've got friendly ushers here. They're going to jump up right now wherever they're seated, and uh, they're going to help you. All right? And while they're getting ready to be friendly and jump up, I want to talk to those of you who are watching online right now. We're glad to have you. Brand new series beginning right now. Title of the series, Martin Luther and the New Reformation. Title of this particular teaching, I, a poor, stinking bag of dung, quoting Luther himself. We're going to get to that. But you see study guide there with part one. Click on the study guide. You'll be able to join us as we 
move into this study. All right, let's go. Jot it down. Number one, four takeaways. Takeaway number one, only Jesus. Only Jesus. Put verse 2 on the screen for us again, please. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. How does it read? But I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Only Jesus. True to a storm panic vow, young Martin, the university student, presents himself to the black cloister in the little city of Erfurt to join the Augustinian order of monks. Once accepted into the order, he has, he has his head shaved. You remember the tonsure? Looks like a bald head with a hula hoop on it. The tonsure, but it was a big deal back then. You had the tonsure, that's a sign of respect. It's also protection. Don't touch the bald-headed man. He's a priest. Martin Luther, young, novice, rigorous spiritual dis discipline. Guess what? Now he's being awakened every morning, 2 o'clock. Every morning, 2 o'clock. Out of bed, out of bed, out of bed, down to worship, down to worship. That would be the first of seven worship services through the day. Prayer, confession, penance. Prayer, confession, penance, worship, worship, worship. Martin Luther would later write, put, it, put Luther's words on the screen, I was a good monk, and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out if I had kept on, kept on any longer. I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading, and other work. Ah, but young Martin, God bless him, young Martin, such a conscientious young man, is driven, driven to do more, to do more. I'm going to win. I'm going to win this game. I will win the affection of heaven. Martin again on the screen, Luther, when I was a monk, I was unwilling to omit any of the prayers, but I often accumulated my appointed prayers for a whole week. It's supposed to be done at a certain time, certain day. I accumulated, accumulated them for a week or even two or three weeks. Then, here's what I would do. I would take a Saturday off or shut myself in for as long as three days without food or drink until I had said all the prayers I had missed. This made my head split, and as a consequence, I couldn't close my eyes for five nights. I lay sick unto death, and I went out of my senses. Even after I quickly recovered and I tried again to read, my head went round and round, driven, driven to win the affection of an angry God. James Kittleson, one of his biographers, on factum, Luther coined that word, on factum was what Luther later called this grinding sense of being utterly lost. By it, he intended the idea of swarming attacks of doubt that could convince people that God's love was not for them. Later, he considered this sense of being irredeemably evil to be the work of Satan, who sought to make a Christian's sins, doubts, anxieties too much even for the grace of God. At such moments, just the rustling of dried leaves in a forest sounded like the legions of hell coming to seize one's soul. The guy is struggling, and we might as well be candid right here at the beginning. It's not just a spiritual issue. Derek Wilson, the English biographer, put his words on the screen. Certainly, Luther went through periods of black depression when he retreated into himself and spoke to no one. He never fully shrugged off this particular demon until the end of his days would retire into a room by himself when problems weighed heavily upon him. Pause button right there. Come on, come on, guys. No clucking of the tongues, please. Let us be reminded that in sacred history, some of the greatest, some of the giants were plagued with depression. It's not a sin to be depressed. It's not wrong to be depressed. Elijah, depressed. John the Baptist, depressed. Jesus in Gethsemane, depressed. Martin Luther, depressed. Charles Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers in the 19th century, called depression his black dog that would come to him every now and then. It's not a sin. Some of you are struggling with depression right now. You're on medication. That's why it's for. That's why you're taking it. It's to help you. It's okay. God is not angry at you. Depression is just a part of life. And you got it. Don't you ever feel guilty for that depression. That's Luther. It would take 10 years for him to finally break through, just break through somehow. What's bothering him? I put it on the screen. Luther again, I greatly long to understand Paul's epistles to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the justice of God, because I took it to mean that, just, that justice whereby God is just and deals justly in punishing the unjust, that would be me. My situation was that although an impeccable monk 
I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him, that it would please him, that it would gratify him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Days and nights. Days and nights. Some of you know the meaning of this. Some of you know this desperate struggle to somehow get God to love you in the end. Days and nights. And then there's a breakthrough. Oh, it didn't come just with a snap of a finger. It's been accumulating slowly. God's timetable is not ours. Slowly God says, now come on, Martin, Martin, think, think, think with me. Here comes the breakthrough. He writes about it here. Luther again on the screen. Then one day I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy God justifies us through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. It's just like the ceiling over us just opens and there is paradise. And up we go. That's what happened to him. There was a breakthrough. There's nothing wrong with a breakthrough. Don't give up. That's the point. Don't quit. It took years for him. Don't quit. The God of this universe is drawing you to that moment when those doors will open emotionally, when they will open spiritually, and you will see what you never saw before. Don't give up. <laughs> Martin Luther, who would describe himself once with these words, I, a poor, stinking bag of dung, finally found peace with his Savior Jesus. Ah, what a grand takeaway from that old Reformation. Only Jesus. How did Paul put it in a, a moment ago? What was this verse 2? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I need to know. I, a poor, stinking bag of dung. Look at this, 1 Timothy 1.15. That's what Paul is saying right here. 115 on the screen. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, a stinking bag of dung. I'm the worst of the worst. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the glad news all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the gospel. It's the great takeaway. Only Jesus. Someone came to HMS Richards, the great Bible preacher. Ah. Oh. When I grow up, I want to be like him. He once declared, you jot this down in your study guide because it's in your study guide. I have only one doctrine, okay? I have only one doctrine. I am a great sinner, but I have a great Savior. And then when he was asked, hey, Mr. Pastor Richards, what is the Adventist message? He replied, Jesus only. Jesus only. That's it. Jesus only. Takeaway number one, oh God, that we would be known as a Jesus people, that we would, be, we would be known in our little village, in our little county, in our little world, that we would be known as the Jesus people where Jesus only is what feeds and drives their souls. There are four takeaways. Takeaway number one, Jesus only. Takeaway number two, only the cross. I mean, come on, we just read it. Verse 2 again. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yep, Calvary, the cross. On one occasion, this is before the gospel light broke in. Oh, poor Luther. He is with his mentor who happens to be the vicar, the, the vicar of the Augustinian order where Luther was monk and priest. His name is jo Johann von Staupitz. He is pouring out his heart, pouring out his heart. By the way, let me tell you about von Stoppitz. Those, those were dear friends. Stoppitz, when he dies, said of, of Luther, his love to me was greater than a woman's. There was nothing going between them. That's only this generation who would read that. He was like a father to Luther. And while they had to part ways theologically, they were one. Pouring out his heart to von Stoppitz. Finally, he cuts him off. Martin. God is not angry at you. Do you understand this? You are angry at him. The cross, Martin, the cross. Look at the cross. Hey, not bad from a vicar of an Augustinian order. 
of the Roman Catholic faith, he said exactly what God's man needed to hear. Exactly. It was the gospel. Wow. One of the great Reformation paintings is by a friend of Luther's who was also a parishioner of his named uh, Lucas Cranach. I'm going to put that. I've seen this painting. I've been to Wittenberg. Oh, my. And it's the town church. That's the name of the church in Wittenberg. This is, this is there behind the, uh, the altar there in the Lutheran church. There it is. This is the preaching of Paul. This is the preaching of Paul. That's, that's the way uh, Lucas wanted to depict it. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the way Luther preached. It's the way Paul preached. In fact, Luther, let me put Luther's words on the screen for you. The wounds of Jesus, oh, I love this. The wounds of Jesus are safe enough for us. <laughs> safe enough. Whatever's going on in your life, get your finger into those wounds like Thomas. Let the wounds heal you. By his wounds we are healed, Isaiah 53. The wounds of Jesus are safe enough. In a letter to a friend of his, therefore, my sweet brother. This is beautiful. Therefore, my sweet brother. Learn Christ in him crucified, despairing of yourself. Learn to pray to him, saying, You, Lord Jesus, are my righteousness, but I am your sin. You have taken on yourself what you were not and have given me what I was not. And I want that little five foot three inch American writer and spiritual leader. Boy, that was a takeaway she grabbed from the Reformation. Listen to her on the cross, her words on the screen. By the way, your study guide has all of these in it. The lower she's writing, the lower you lie at the foot of the cross. This is beautiful. The lower you lie at the foot of the cross, the dearer and more exalted will be your con conception of your Redeemer. Just lie low at the foot of the cross. Here's one more. The theme that attracts the heart of the sinner is Christ and Him crucified. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus stands revealed to the world in un Parallel love. It's the pinnacle of all truth. And anybody who comes and tells you, yeah, but it's not quite, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. It is the summation of God's revelation. For third millennials like you and me, what takeaway is there in a story 500 years old, dusty and moldy? Ugh, takeaway number one. Only Jesus. Take away number two. Only the cross. And oh God, would you make us a people who gather low at the foot of the cross? We won't be haughty then. We won't be judgmental then. We will not tear each other down then. We will be what you need us to be at the foot of the cross. Sinners, all of us, we pray. Oh, but there's takeaway number three. Jot it down. Only the Bible. And Paul talks about that. This is verse 1. And, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. When I came walking into town, I had one thing. I had the Word of God, and that's what I brought to you. It's all I brought to you. Only the Bible. Many historians conclude, by the way, that Martin Luther's greatest contribution... The single most influential act that affected human history, yea, even changed the history of the Western world, was his translation of the Bible into the vernacular of his people, into German. Derek Wilson, the Englishman again, put it on the screen for you. Within decades of Luther's death, all Europe was awash with Bibles and contemporary languages. This was the richest part of, the Martin, Luther, of Martin Luther's legacy. He bequeathed to the peoples of the world a collection of religious writings and invested them with supreme authority, or as he would have said, recognized the supreme authority they manifestly possessed. Sola Scriptura, as the Reformers would proclaim. The Bible only. In fact, Luther himself once gloried in the Bible. This is beautiful. On the screen, Luther, God's Word cannot be without God's people, and God's people cannot be without God's Word. For it is the Word of God which builds the church, where that Word is heard, where baptism, the sacrament of the altar, that would be the Lord's Supper, where the forgiveness of sins are administered there, hold fast and conclude most certainly that there, here, is the house of God, and there, here, is the gate to heaven. The church exists because of the Word and only the Word. Only the Word. Sola Scriptura. Huge takeaway. Man, they were, did they drill this into us as kids? I mean, did they drill it? I'm just going to find out how, how it got drilled into you. The B-I-B-L-E 
Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. You must have had the Sabbath school teacher I had. Boy, she was relentless. Thank God for our Sabbath school teachers here. Godly men and women. The little kids get it. And we must get it. It's the Bible. The Bible. Takeaway number one, only the Savior. Takeaway number two, only the cross. Takeaway number three, only the Bible. Oh, God, if the day could come when, like the pioneers for whom this church is a memorial, like the pioneers of this little movement who were immersed and awash in Scripture, if only we could become again the people of the Word, the Bible people. Ah. Ellen White. Boy, she... Did she want to have this prayer answered or what? This is great controversy. Let me put it on the screen for you. Describing Luther's legacy. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Now listen, the opinions of learned men, we have a seminary on this campus, the opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, we have science building, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one or all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, and what's that last phrase? We should demand a plain, what's that last phrase? Thus says the Lord. Right here. You show me here. You show me here. I'll accept it. You have to show me here, though. You show me here. Plain. Thus saith the Lord. Ah, oh, only the Savior, only the cross, only four of these, only the Bible. One more. Only the Holy Spirit. Write that down, please. Only the Holy Spirit. Because that's what Paul's talking about right here. Look at verse 3. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom but on God's power. Holy Spirit. The truth is, and you know this, ideas infused by the Holy Spirit change the world. I mean, we got a generation now that's into change. Let's change this world. Guess what, guys? You want to change this world? You won't be able to do it without him. Not if you're going to change it forever. And that's the only kind of change I want is forever change. I'm not into one lifetime or one generation or two months change. Forever change. The only, and the only way that forever change comes is through the mighty third person of the God. And he is the fire. He is the catalyst. He is the ignition of every movement that God sends to this planet. It always comes through him. And I love the way King Solomon describes what is the truth about our Reformation that we inherit today as we start a new Reformation going that way. But look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Can you believe this? This is, this is it. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun shining ever brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter till the full light of day. You ever, go walking before, you ever go walking before the sun is up, go running like I do before the sun's up, and you're, you're just walking along or running along, jogging along, and you watch, you're watching the eastern horizon. You get those little shafts of orange and then yellow. They just shoo, shoo, shoo. And you just keep your eye on it. Just keep your eye. It doesn't seem like there's any change, but there just seems to be more of these things coming up little by little by little. And eventually, if you're still out walking, that old, that glorious old golden face rises above the foothills, that's Reformation. It doesn't stop here. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter. The closer we get, the brighter it gets. The closer we get, the brighter it gets. It's supposed to get brighter. I need you to get that. It's supposed to get brighter. The trouble with modern Protestantism, we build a fence around our favorite reformer, and we haven't budged since. The problem with modern evangelists, Even within our faith community, we build a fence around, what was her name again? We build a fence around and say, that's it. We don't go any further. Oh, that can't be right. Put Ellen White on the screen, please. Great controversy again. 
The Reformation did not, as many suppose, end with Luther. No, 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 no. It is to be continued to the close, C-L-O-S-E, to the close of this world's history. Luther had a great work to do in reflecting to others the light which God permitted to shine upon him, yet he did not receive all the light which was to be given to the world from that time to this. New light has been continually shining upon the Scriptures, and new truths have been constantly unfolding, end quote. Guess what? Martin Luther did not receive all the light. Step a few years closer, John Calvin did not receive all the light. Step a few years closer, Ellen White did not receive all the light. It's humanly impossible, ladies and gentlemen, for one human being to be the receptacle of all truth. If you were the receptacle of all truth, you'd be Almighty God. And you can't be, because I know you. It keeps shining brighter and brighter. The closer and closer we get, the brighter and brighter it gets. It keeps shining until one day that whole planet will be lighted with the glory of Revelation 18.1 and the sun will rise in the sky one last time for the salvation of the human race. Brighter and brighter. Only the Holy Spirit. Ideas infused by the Holy Spirit, that's what changes the world. You want to change the world? Then, then maybe what we were on to the last time we were together in September, maybe what we were on to is what we need to stay on to, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember that? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we ought to keep asking and not end with, okay, what's the new, what's the new uh, soup de jour? What's the new flavor today? No. What did Jesus say? Luke 11, verse 13. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who, as the Greek adds, those who continually, day after day after day, plead for the Holy Spirit. Plead for the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm praying around here? Because you thought we'd just forget it. After September, do I come back and we'll be into Martin Luther? We won't be into this. No, nope, wrong. You know what I'm praying for? 99 other pleaders. 99 other pleaders who every day before they go out into the world will be on their knees supplicating the God of this universe, you've got to baptize me all over again today. I need what Jesus said. Morning by morning, Jesus asked you for this baptism. Morning by morning, I'm asking you. Give me 99 others. 99 others. And this world will never be the same again. 99 plus one. Why not? No wonder Jesus on the eve of his death, having his eye on the new reformation to come. Uh, we're going to go. Please turn to this. Don't read it on the screen. John chapter, this is our last text. John 16. No wonder. John 16. No wonder Jesus made this promise. Beginning in verse 12. Because we've got to get verse 12 in order to know verse 13 is the value of verse 13. So here's verse 12. Red letters in my Bible. John 16, 12. I have much. This is on the eve. He'll be dead in 24 hours. Dead. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now, because it's humanly impossible for any mind to absorb all the truth of the universe. I have more to say. I'll be back to you. How are you going to come back, Lord? How are you going to come back? He says, verse 13, ah, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Jot it down in your mind, not your study guide. There are two missions for the Holy Spirit. He will guide us into all truth. That means brighter and brighter the closer and closer we get. And he will show us what is yet to come. Next Sabbath. Whoa, it's going to be touchy next Sabbath. If you can't be here, that would be okay because that would be rather controversial next Sabbath. So just maybe stay at home and do something. It's going to be touchy. But we have to deal with it. We only have three Sabbaths. You've got to deal with everything in three Sabbaths. That's the mission of the Holy Spirit. He will not only guide us into all truth, he's going to say, heads up, something's about to break. Listen to me. Listen to me. Something is about to break. Watch. Listen and pray. We get it a day in advance, a year in advance, a month in advance, an hour in advance. I have no idea. He will tell you what is yet to come. Hmm. Which means, I repeat, the risk of repeating myself, that the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the brighter and brighter the light will be. Brighter and brighter as we go get closer and closer. Ellen White's declaration, now listen to me carefully, I need you to really hear this. 
Ellen White's declaration that the Reformation must go on means that new light, those are her words, those are her words, new light must be continually shining upon the Scriptures and new truths, her words again, must const, must, must, is it constantly? Yeah, constantly, the word is constantly. And new truths must constantly be unfolding. Could it be that the discussions this last week at the annual council of the General Conference cannot be just about the unity of the church. Could it be they are also about the unity of truth? Could it be that someday Joel 2's end-time prophecy that your sons and your daughters will prophesy, for even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Could it be that new light and new truths heretofore unrecognized or accepted by this faith community could break through with light yet to come, come to this faith community. Come Could it be? Could it be? Didn't Jesus promise when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you. Stay close to him. He's the best gift you have. Baptize us, God. Baptize us with the Holy Spirit, I pray. Four legacies from the Reformation that we must embrace and take with us. The old is gone. We're going to start a new Reformation. It starts right now, but we must not throw the old away. There are four precious legacies. Only Jesus, only the cross, only the Bible, and only the Holy Spirit. Perhaps all four are summarized by a note they found in Martin Luther's coat after he died. He died at the age of 62. Those who were dearest on earth to him were undressing the body. And as they pulled the coat off, they found folded a little piece of paper stuck in a pocket. They pulled it out, they unfolded it, and they read. It's, it's written in both German and Latin. Here it is. It simply read, Hach est verum. This is true. Wir sind alle Pettler. We are all beggars. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it is true about you and me. We have nothing. Zero. Nada. Nothing. Only Jesus. We are all beggars. Just like Luther. Beggars. But we have Jesus. But we have Jesus. We have Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to join us in worship today. I'd like to spend another moment with you here at the end of our program to share with you a gift of hope. In these uncertain times, this little book, The Great Hope, will help you understand what God has planned for your future, and not just your future, but the, for the future of the human race. In this 500th anniversary of the Great Reformation, we recognize that Luther had a mighty work to do, but the truth is, he didn't recognize all the light of Holy Scripture. How could he have? He's just one life. New light has been continually shining since his time, and new truths have been constantly unfolding. This book, The Great Hope, is a story of that continuing reformation. So grab your phone, dial our toll-free number, 877-HIS-WILL. Remember the two words, 877-HIS-WILL, and we'll get a copy to you right away. Until the next time we meet, may the peace of our Lord Jesus be with you.